Paul went from thinking he was the right type of person to being able to say, no, 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 that's not who I am at all. I'm a sinner like everybody else. Trying to stop that message, but my sin was not too great for his mercy and therefore I've been mercied like nobody else. a lot of Christmas parties going on. Uh, we had to cancel our attendance at some of them because there's just so many parties flying around. I know the women had their Christmas party uh, last night and then the men had their party the week before. And I know you probably have family parties and work parties and lots of parties that are coming up over this next week and you'll be really tired by the time you get to Christmas. But it reminds me of a time in the early 2000s uh, when a website called Evite came out. Now, does anyone still use Evite? Is that still around? No one knows. Okay, so maybe not. Well, Evite came out in the late 1990s, but it really took off in the early 2000s as a social planning website where someone could get your email address and create this cool website for a party and then email you on the Evite and you could respond, yes, no, or if you're really cool, maybe. Yes, no, or maybe. And what was great about Evite was it was the first time that we'd really figured out a way to make party planning simple. Before that, we used to send invitations in the mail like cavemen. But when Evite came around, you were able to invite people via their email address, and then the person who was planning the party could look easily online and see exactly how many people were coming to the party. And it was super convenient. Now, I know that's a while ago. Now we have Facebook events, and those, those kind of things make it easier as well. But at that time, Evite was kind of revolutionary because it allowed the party planner to know exactly how many people were coming. But there was an, an unintended consequence because the party planner knew how many people were coming, but everyone else was able to see on the website exactly who was coming. And so people began to not reply yes or no because they wanted to wait and see who else was coming. So, you know, in your early 20s, if that was when Evite hit, or if you were in college or something like that, you looked for all the cool people. Are all the cool people going to go? I'm going to wait to respond to see if they, uh, if they go. And uh, if no one else is going, then I'm just going to either not respond. That's what you did. That's how you didn't offend the person. You just didn't respond and be like, oh, I don't think I responded to your party planning, uh, Evite. But that's just a way of saying no. But if you felt like all the cool people were going, then you would say, yeah, I'm going too. But if you looked at that list and you saw a lot of people who made you feel awkward, you wouldn't go. If you looked at that Evite list and you saw people who were going to drain you of your energy, you didn't go. You clicked no and you didn't go to the party. If you saw people that you didn't get along with, you certainly didn't go. And if you looked on that Evite and saw people who had offended you or done wrong towards you, you clicked no and you did not go. Today, we're looking at 1 Timothy chapter 1. And as we look at it, we kind of see Jesus looking forward to coming to an event. The event is his arrival on earth. And he's able to see the list of who's going to be there before he gets there. And now there are certainly people who are going to be awkward. There are certainly people who are going to be draining, certainly people he's going to struggle to get along with, like the Pharisees. And there are definitely going to, people who, going to be people who do him wrong. But everyone on the list of people that he's going to interact with when he comes into the world, every single one is going to be a sinner. Everyone's going to be a sinner. Someone who has rebelled against God, who has shaken their fists at God's plan 
for life. And what that means for Jesus as he, as he enters into this world and he sees who's going to be there, there is no one like him. As Jesus comes into the world, there is no one like him. His people are the Father and the Holy Spirit. The Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. Sinless, perfect beings who have loved each other from eternity past. And he looks at the list of people who are in the world, and all he sees is a list of sinners. Yet what Paul wants us to get out of this passage today is that knowing that, Jesus came into the world, into a world full of sinners. But not just to be there, Jesus came to save sinners. Sinners like you and sinners like me. Let's read. 1 Timothy 1, 12 through 17, Paul writes off and says, I give thanks to Christ Jesus our Lord who has strengthened me because he considered me faithful, appointing me to the ministry even though I was formerly a blasphemer, a persecutor, an arrogant man, but I received mercy because I acted out of ignorance and unbelief. And the grace of our Lord overflowed along with the faith and love that are in Christ Jesus. This saying is trustworthy and deserving of full acceptance. Would you say this in the capitals with me? Christ Jesus came into the world to save sinners. And then Paul says, and I am the worst of them. But I received mercy for this reason so that in me, the worst of them, Christ Jesus might demonstrate his extraordinary patience as an example to those who would believe in him for eternal life. Now to the king eternal, immortal invisible, the only God, be honor and glory forever and ever. Amen. The word of God. The one thing Paul wants us to get today is that Christ Jesus came into the world to save sinners. But attached to that, is once you get that statement, once you get that reality, once you understand that's who Jesus came into the world for, it changes the way that you view yourself. It changes the way that you think about yourself. It changes the way that you imagine yourself. It transforms your view of who you are. Now hang with me, because Paul starts off by saying, Christ Jesus came into the world to save sinners, and I am the worst of them. And you go, oh, wait a minute. Here it is, it's the religious guilt. Paul is just pouring guilt on himself and that's what, that's what this is all about. When Jesus came into the world to save sinners, that's what this is all about, religious guilt. It's about feeling bad about ourselves, or even worse, maybe Paul is faking it and it's some sort of false humility that he's saying when he says, I am the worst of sinners. But that's not at all what Paul is getting at. For Paul, in his own viewpoint of himself, Paul thought that he was the right type of person. If you read through the book of Philippians, he said he had everything going for him. He came from the right family, and he came from the right tribe. And his parents had followed the religion of Judaism from day one of his life, and they followed all the traditions and as Paul grew older, he was trained in the Jewish law, and he had absolute sincerity as he was following God, and he did all the right type of things. Paul viewed himself as the right type of person, but the thing was is he was blind to who he really was, because when the message of Jesus began to spread, Paul began persecuting followers of Jesus, and he was opposed to Jesus himself and he was blind to who Christ was. Look at how Paul describes himself in verse 13. This isn't false humility. This is facts about who he was. He says, though I was formerly a blasphemer, a persecutor, and an arrogant man. Now, Paul had thought he was defending God when he persecuted Christians. But in reality, he was blaspheming God. Now, Paul thought that he was protecting who God was and the traditions that they held, but in reality, he was a persecutor of those who were actually following God. 
Paul thought he was humbly serving God, but actually he was an arrogant man. He thought he was the right type of person, but he was blind to who he really was. And what opened his eyes was the journey he took on the Damascus Road. When Jesus met him, when the resurrected, ascended Jesus appeared to Paul and said, Saul, which was his former name, Saul, Saul, why do you persecute me? And it was at that moment, face to face with Jesus, that Paul got a glimpse of who he really was for the first time. Now, the irony is after that, Paul was actually physically blinded. He had some scales or something over his eyes that that didn't allow him to see, but that was a representation of how he had been blind to who he was. And even though he was now physically blind, he actually could spiritually see. He could see who Jesus was. He could see who he was. And here's the conclusion he reached. I'm a sinner like everybody else. Paul went from thinking he was the right type of person to being able to say, no, 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 that's not who I am at all. I'm a sinner like everybody else. Being exposed to Jesus face to face broke down Paul's view of himself. You could almost say that being encountered by Jesus Christ deconstructed Paul's view of who he was. So that he says, now I'm a sinner like everybody else. What's interesting about this passage, if you go just back a few verses before we, before we read, Paul talks about people who are rebelling against God. And he says it's an offense to the good news of Jesus. It's not just bad stuff. It is that what people are doing is against the gospel. And he says they're rebels. They're murderers. They, they follow their own desires for sexuality rather than following God's design for sexuality. They're slave traders. They're unrighteous. They're the wrong kind of people. And then Paul says, and me too. And me too. I'm the wrong kind of person. I thought I was the right kind of person until I encountered Jesus on the Damascus Road. And then when I came face to face with Jesus, I realized that I'm not the right kind of person at all. I'm a sinner like everybody else. Christianity offers us such unique resources to deal with who we really are and deal with the sin of others. One thing I see when people try and deal with sin in themselves and with others is they just say, well, everybody's a sinner, so let's not worry about it, which is not what Paul's saying at all. Paul's saying, you're a sinner. What you do is offensive to God, and it's not okay and God's wrath is against sin, and I'm a sinner, and what I've done is offensive to God, and it's not okay, and God's wrath is against my sin. Do you see the difference? It's saying this really matters versus we're all sinners and let's just sweep it under the rug. Paul's saying, no, it's an offense to a holy and righteous God, but I'm a sinner like everybody else. One thing we also do when it comes to sin is we go, yeah, we're all sinners, but I'm just a little bit of a better person than you are. My sin kind of doesn't stink as much as yours does. But that's not what Paul says either. Paul calls out what sin really is as he sees it in the culture, and yet he sees the nuances and the depth and the grotesqueness of his own sin. Just like the people we're sinning against Jesus, he sees his sin against Jesus and thinks it's worse. As he sees his life from Jesus' perspective, he's able to say this in verse 15. He says, Christ Jesus came into the world to save sinners, and I am the worst. Now again, is Paul going through some sort of unnecessary guilt process here? Is this just shame upon shame. No, he's thinking factually about who he was. Paul says that he was ignorant 
of who Jesus Christ was. He was blind that Jesus was in fact the Messiah, and so he spent his life trying to stop the message that Jesus was the Messiah. But though he was ignorant of this fact, he was not innocent. If you go 120 miles down I-95 and a police officer pulls you over and says, do you know how fast you're going? And the speed limit's only 70, and you go, oh, I didn't know. You might be ignorant, but you are not innocent. Paul was ignorant of the fact that Jesus was the Messiah, but he was not innocent of the fact that he was against Jesus as the Messiah. In fact, his hands were stained with the blood of Christians that he had killed. He had kept people from believing the gospel because he had tried to stop the message that Jesus Christ is the Messiah. But for Paul... The idea that he is a sinner like everybody else is also joined by the reality that he had been mercied like no one else. Paul had been mercied like nobody else. In verse 13 and 14, he says, but I received mercy. Literally, the word is like mercied. I was mercied. I didn't get what I deserved. I received mercy because I acted out of ignorance in unbelief. And the grace of our Lord overflowed along with the faith and love that are in Christ Jesus. Paul says, I've been mercied like nobody else. Jesus has shown mercy to me. And just the idea of mercy is that it is not deserved. Mercy by nature is something that you don't deserve a chance at. Justice says that you get punishment, but mercy says someone else will absorb the punishment. Mercy in and of itself is not something that Paul deserves, and it's not something that we deserve. But it doesn't stop there. Paul says that in God's mercy, there had been hatred for Christians, But when he encountered Jesus and the mercy of God, now he has love for Christians. In God's mercy, he had been in unbelief against Jesus Christ. He had tried to stop the message that Jesus is the Messiah. But in God's mercy, he came to a place of believing that Jesus is the Messiah. Throughout this passage, four different times, Paul references his Jesus. And he doesn't just say Jesus, he says Christ Jesus. That's the word for Messiah. That's the word for the Messiah King. So Paul is literally telling us, Messiah Jesus. I received mercy because I acted out of ignorance and unbelief, and the grace of our Lord overflowed along with the faith and love that are in, I get to say it now, Messiah Jesus. He's the one that produced that belief in me that Jesus is the Messiah because I lived my life trying to stop that message. But my sin was not too great for his mercy, and therefore I've been mercied like nobody else. In fact, the mercy was almost scandalous. Paul says in verse 12 that he was called by Jesus to serve Jesus. He was called into the ministry. He was called to be an apostle. He had been someone who had seen Jesus Christ face to face on the road to Damascus, and therefore he was called as an apostle. And this is scandalous. This is unbelievable. In fact, when Paul shows up to meet with the other apostles, they're uncomfortable. They're uncomfortable because of who he was and what he had done to their people. And they don't trust him. But that's what God's mercy does. God's mercy takes people who are sinners and mercies them in a way where you go, should this person be in the room? I mean, haven't they gone too far? Isn't this too much? Can Jesus show that much mercy to someone who is so opposed to him? And the answer is yes. Jesus' mercy is scandalous. It's so scandalous that when Jesus shows mercy to people, it makes everybody else uneasy. That makes us reflect on our own stories as we think about Paul saying, I've been mercied like nobody else. How have you been mercied by Jesus? What part of your life is scandalous? 
that you might be afraid would exclude you, but that Jesus sees and reaches in and shows mercy in that very area of brokenness. Too often as Christians, I think, I think we can walk around with this attitude like, if people would just be more like me, whatever that is, then they'd get their act together. But that's not what it means to be a Christian. What it means to be a Christian is I am a sinner, but I have been mercied by Jesus Christ. And if I told you all the stuff I've done and all the stuff I do, you would not believe it. You would think it's scandalous. But Jesus' mercy is never ending. That's why Paul says that the grace of the Lord Jesus overflowed. It just kept coming. I heard someone describe it like Niagara Falls. Niagara Falls, the water at Niagara Falls, it just comes and it pours, and then it comes and it pours, and then it comes and it pours, and it comes and it pours, and it comes and it pours, and it it doesn't stop. So is the grace of our Lord Jesus towards sinners who turn to him and know him. And so often we can live our lives as if, you know, if people should just be a little bit more like me. I have such a great personality. If people would be strong like me, if if they would overcome their problems like I have, if they could get a little more organized, if they could just understand the social problems we have in our country from my perspective, if they would just be a little bit more like me, then it would be okay. What, What if we all adopted the attitude and just said, I cannot believe that I've been mercied. (laughs) The answer isn't what I know and forcing my opinion on you. The answer isn't you being more like me. The only hope I have is that Jesus showed me mercy. And the only hope you have is that Jesus will show you mercy. And the good news is that he will. Paul is so confident in the mercy of Jesus that he sees the reason behind Jesus showing mercy. In verse 16, he says, but I received mercy for this reason, so that in me, the worst of them, Christ Jesus might demonstrate his extraordinary patience as an example to those who would believe in him for eternal life. Paul's saying, I'm a demonstration. I'm a sinner like everybody else. I've been mercied like nobody else, but I'm a demonstration for anybody else that Christ Jesus came into the world to save sinful people. If you want to know that's true, look at my life. If Jesus can show me mercy, then he can show anybody mercy. Paul sees his life as a demonstration for anybody else that Christ is merciful and he came into the world to save sinners. And I love that he says that Jesus Christ, that Christ Jesus might demonstrate his extraordinary patience. We don't like to show patience with people, but we also don't like to ask for people to be patient with us because it feels incredibly weak. Like, hey, I don't have my act together. I'm kind of falling apart. I don't really have much to offer. Could you please be patient with me? No one likes to say that. And yet, Jesus' patience with Paul is Paul's greatest confidence. I am a mess, but in my mess, Jesus is showing me mercy that he might demonstrate just how extraordinarily patient he is with sinners like me. See, as Christians, it's not about having our life together perfectly. None of us do. It's not about being on top of our spiritual walk in such a way that everyone envies how much we read of the F-260 this year. No, what Jesus is doing in your life is a demonstration of his mercy and patience to sinful people. This is our Advent series. And at Advent, we try and reframe and understand what Christmas is about. 
from this passage, what Paul is saying is that if we really get Christmas, we'll get why Jesus came. And to get why Jesus came is to understand that Jesus came to save sinners. And to understand that Jesus came to save sinners is to understand that you are on the list of sinners that Jesus came to save, just like everybody else's. But Jesus came to save sinners so that he could show his extraordinary mercy to you and that you might be transformed. And as you're transformed, that might be a demonstration of how merciful Jesus Christ is. See, if we get Christmas, it really changes our perspective on who we are. We don't say I'm the right kind of person. We say I'm all the wrong kind of people. Yet Jesus showed me mercy and I remember that so vividly here at Christmas. I'm on that list and I'm a sinner like everybody else. But if we really get Christmas, we'll end the passage here with what uh, we're called to do and that's we'll praise. Paul ends this passage by praising Jesus. If I'm a demonstration of God's mercy, if I'm a demonstration for anybody else, it's only because Jesus invites sinful people to come to himself. Jesus came to save sinners so sinners could come to God. Amen? Would you stand with me and read verse 17? Paul ends this passage by saying this and say it with me. Now to the King eternal, immortal, invisible, the only God, be honor and glory forever and ever. Amen. Let's worship him.